Hello, good evening everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening for the third uh, webinar in the BIX virtual BIX 20 series. And um, my name is Louise Page. I'm the current president of uh, British Interpartum Care Society. And um, uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everybody. And um, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers, as I'm sure you'll have all seen from uh, the information that's been on the website about their, their backgrounds. Um, I think it's fair to say that we all acknowledge that um, this is potentially a very challenging topic for, for many people and um, I really would encourage you all to, I guess, open your hearts and minds and listen to what um, our speakers have to say this evening so that we can reflect on, on, on the discussion that I'm sure will, will, will um, take place after, after their presentations. I'm going to hand over now to um, two of the um, committee members. So firstly to Vicky Cochran, who's our midwifery rep on the BICS committee, and also to Chim, who's the South of England rep, who will be um, co-chairing the, uh, the session this evening. Thank you all very much. Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm going to hand over to Chim and she will take you through the first speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Louise, and thank you, uh, Vicky. Um, our first uh, speaker is Marion Knight, and Marion Knight is a professor of maternal and child population health at the National Perinatal Epidemiology uh, University of Oxford. Uh, she's also a very senior investigator at the National Institute for Health Research UK, and her research mainly focuses on um, using national observation studies to address clinical questions um, concerning severe complications of pregnancy and early pregnancy life. She has also led the Embrace UK um, uh, confidential, Embrace UK national confidential inquiries into maternal deaths and morbidities since 2012. So she's going to introduce the, the first topic for us looking at the uh, black asian and ethnic minority uh, staff including service users in terms of uh, understanding the embrace outcome and the covid uh, outcome as well understanding the current challenges within the maternity system so over to you prof marian thank you thank you very much Thank you, Chim and uh, Vicky, for inviting me to talk. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, and I obviously the the topic this evening is is not just thinking about uh, service users and their allies, but also um, black, Asian and minority ethnic staff. Um, as you'll be aware, the majority of the, the work I'm involved with is around um, women and babies. So I'm not going to be able to, to contribute to the debate uh, uh, about staff, uh, but I think um, Gloria will be able to, to cover that very well later. So you'll all be very familiar with um, uh, Embrace reports and Effectively, what has been largely, when you look at a, a, a national level, uh, a, not an unchanging uh, maternal mortality rate. Uh, but obviously, I have to point out that, that the mortana, maternal mortality rate is still low. So um, the, the risk of dying in pregnancy in the UK is small. Uh, and, and on that basis for women, obviously, our maternity services are very safe. And when we look at the pattern overall, this is quite reassuring. It uh, over uh, the past 20 years or so, it um, has been largely a, a decreasing trend and particularly looking at the bottom line uh, in terms of maternal deaths, mostly uh, directly relevant to, to the Intrapartum Care Society. So those uh, women dying from, from direct pregnancy complications such as hemorrhage, preeclampsia, uh, those uh, uh, rates have continued to decrease. But we know our population is changing. Um, many more women are uh, entering pregnancy with pre-existing health problems, for example. Uh, we have different expectations, uh, different uh, 
population characteristics, much more so socially complex, um, you know, from a public health point of view, not necessarily um, uh, some of the uh, behaviours might impact on our um, uh, pregnancy population characteristics. So there's a lot underlying um, those changes. But particularly, uh, as again, many of you are very familiar with, there are uh, disparities in outcomes amongst different population groups. And you will all be very familiar with these figures, which show that amongst uh, black women in the UK, they have a five times higher risk of dying in pregnancy than white women. But absolutely crucially, we must look at those absolute rates. And I don't want uh, anybody to be um, to become terrified of, of giving birth in the UK. Uh, it is for, for black women, uh, about one in every 2,500 women uh, will die during uh, or up to six weeks after pregnancy. So it is still very uncommon. The most important thing for me uh, is however, this uh, graph, which actually shows that that disparity between black women and white women is actually getting larger. So the top line indicates the maternal mortality rate for black women. Uh, the, uh, the line with the solid um, black circles is the maternal mortality rate for, for white women, which you can see is, is static or decreasing slightly. We know though that there are other disparities between different population groups. So we know that older women uh, are more likely to uh, die during or after pregnancy. And we know that women who live in more deprived areas of the UK are more likely to die in pregnancy. But by and large, these don't show, the differences between these groups of women don't show the same changing pattern of, of increasing disparity. Uh, there is a, a continuing but fairly consistent disparity between women of different uh, um, uh, age groups and similarly a continuing um, disparity between women from different uh, who live in different uh, uh, areas according to, to level of deprivation. Perhaps the one thing to point out from this graph is that women who live in the least deprived areas, so that is the, uh, again, the, the dark circles and the, uh, and the crosses, their um, maternal mortality rate uh, appears to be decreasing. So the initiatives to, to improve uh, outcomes for women largely seem to be succeeding in those groups. I know I'm talking to the British Intrapartum Care Society, so I do just want to highlight um, uh, a common misconception that, um, you know, by and large, women are not dying in childbirth as a consequence of those direct complications of pregnancy, uh, but from uh, medical and mental health comorbidities. And as I know, you will all be very familiar with the leading cause of maternal death in the UK uh, is actually heart disease. I, by and large, uh, you are used to hearing me talk about outcomes for women, but I think even more pertinent perhaps to our, our conversation today is thinking about outcomes for baby, for babies. Um, and we see the very similar um, patterns in terms of uh, thinking about baby deaths. So by and large, again, we're seeing um, uh, uh, baby death rates are going in the right direction. They are decreasing. But we do know that we have similar disparities if we look at uh, the outcomes of uh, black babies uh, and uh, Asian babies. So there's a, a higher risk of, of dying, um, an 80% higher risk of dying for, for black or black British babies, 60% higher for Asian or Asian British babies. However, I think one, perhaps one of the most important um, uh, things to, to think about and, and to discuss that, that's really pertinent to the, to the whole of this conversation 
is that thinking about very broad groups like that is really is really probably not helpful and there's a lot of, of nuances uh, we need to think in in much more detail about about women's backgrounds and about women as individuals and and you'll hear um, uh, from Natasha about her own individual experience um, and this is just an example um, of thinking about um, uh, thinking about baby outcomes in in more detail in more nuance according to where mum was born so thinking about whether uh, uh, women were born in the UK in their country of origin or uh, in a, another country and you can see that uh, when you start and these this is showing looking at neonatal death rates you can see that when you start uh, splitting uh, splitting groups up women up according to where they were born you can see for example it, it, it reveals different patterns so looking for example here at the uh, uh, group of Pakistani women actually um, Pakistani women uh, babies of Pakistani women who are uh, born in Pakistan are, have a lower uh, neonatal death risk than babies of Pakistani women born in the UK. We can see similar patterns if we look at infant mortality. Again, looking at Pakistani women, you can see you can see that similar pattern. Uh, looking at Black Caribbean women, potentially uh, reflecting that that same pattern, and perhaps actually. Uh, um, showing an even higher uh, mortality rate amongst black Caribbean women who were born neither in the UK nor the Caribbean. So there are clearly a lot of um, uh, underlying factors that we need to think about and we need to tease out. Um, and this doesn't uh, apply solely to, to um, uh, baby deaths, but we can also see exactly the same patterns in preterm birth. And in this instance, in, in almost all the different um, uh, ethnic groups, we can see that preterm birth rates are actually higher amongst women born in the UK, uh, whatever their um, uh, racial group compared with women who were born in their country of origin. So clearly there is this, this reflects something, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a public health physician, this, this clearly reflects something uh, in uh, the environment um, uh, of women who are born in the UK, irrespective of their uh, ethnic group. These disparities were clearly brought into to stark relief by the, the statistics um, when we look at the women who were admitted to hospital with COVID-19 in pregnancy. Most of you will by now be very familiar with the UCOS study and indeed I have to thank many of you for, for contributing uh, information to the study which has been extremely valuable um, for helping to, to plan services at a national level um, and, and indeed helping to, to try and preserve some of the um, uh, maternity services in, in the context of the pandemic. Overall, um, these these data are from the the first six weeks of the uh, of the first wave, at which time about five women uh, per thousand giving birth were hospitalised uh, with SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, not necessarily with with symptomatic infection. At that time, about two thirds of women. Were symptomatic and one third uh, asymptomatic of those uh, admitted. But the ve really um, uh, very um, unexpected and very stark disparity was the proportion of women um, admitted who were from black or other minority ethnic groups uh, of this uh, cohort, about 56% of women. Um, and that pattern has remained unchanged. So we now have uh, information on, on more than 2,000 women and about 50% of the women admitted are from black or other minority ethnic groups. 
So again, reflecting the disparity that, that we see uh, in the EMBRACE data. Uh, other um, uh, groups are overrepresented um, amongst those women admitted. So women, older women uh, were more likely to be admitted, very similar to, to the pattern in the non-pregnant population. Uh, women who were overweight or obese uh, were more likely to be admitted as were uh, women with uh, other medical complications such as hypertension and diabetes. But actually when we, uh, and, and these, these are uh, reflected in very different um, ad admission rates um, amongst women from those different populations. So that um, women who are 35 or over have about twice the rate of admission of those who are uh, aged 20 to 34, uh, women who are overweight and obese, uh, about twice the rate. Um, you can see that black women are eight times more likely to be admitted than white women and Asian women about four times more likely. But when we actually look at the influence of those different factors together to try and identify whether any of those other differences actually explain the ethnic difference, uh, it doesn't appear to. So the, the, the uh, higher um, odds of admission from, of women from black or other minority ethnic groups still persists when taking into account uh, pre-existing medical problems um, uh, overweight or obesity or older maternal age. And uh, these findings were um, underpinned the uh, change in the, in the RCOGRCM guidance, I, highlighting um, the, the need to uh, advise women of, of black and minority ethnic backgrounds that they might be at higher risk of complications of COVID-19 but most importantly, um, to encourage us as health professionals to have a lower threshold to, to review, um, admit, and importantly, consider escalation of, of women of, of black and minority ethnic backgrounds. I apologize to any of you that have seen these data presented recently, but I just wanted to make people aware of the updated outcomes from, from that cohort uh, from the first six weeks of the pandemic, because we now have pregnancy outcomes for the majority of these women. Um, and overall, 10% uh, of women required critical care, uh, but the, you know, the, the good statistic about that is that 90% of women who had critical care uh, survived. So, so much better than, than many uh, who uh, were admitted to critical care. Uh, about a quarter had pneumonia on imaging. But by and large, um, uh, outcomes for their pregnancies were good. So with 94% of women having completed their pregnancy, um, the majority of women have had uh, a live birth. There was a, a 20% um, uh, rate of preterm birth, but the majority of the preterm births were associated with maternal respiratory compromise and when actually you look at the 40 42 percent of women who were discharged while still pregnant their pregnancy outcomes are no different from the pregnancy outcomes of women who have not had COVID-19 um, and and particularly uh, thinking about things like preeclampsia no evidence of any increase uh, in preeclampsia really um, good news for babies, um, although uh, six babies in this cohort were reported to have had a positive test actually uh, when comparing with the, with the data from the neonatal unit, only one of those babies had confirmed infection. Um, and uh, very recently published um, data from the whole of the UK across March and April there were only 66 um, babies under 28 days of age who received inpatient care in the UK with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Only 17 of those babies 
um, had um, mums who were confirmed to have uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, uh, but, but as you will see, most of the infection um, transmission to baby uh, occurred after birth. And really importantly, and, and particularly for, for intrapartum care and for immediate um, postnatal care, this study absolutely supports uh, RCOG, RCM and international guidance to avoid separating mother and baby in the context of, of COVID-19. Um, absolutely also supports um, ongoing support for breastfeeding if, if mothers choose to breastfeed. Now, uh, we're going to hear some, some stories, uh, some, some real women's experiences. I'm, obviously, I have only uh, presented information um, based on numbers and statistics. Uh, we have a, a little bit more information, um, uh, obviously, from confidential inquiries where we can actually investigate in depth the care of, uh, of women who have uh, uh, unfortunately died from COVID-19. And over the three months, March to May, 10 women died uh, with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Eight of those women died from COVID-19 complications. Uh, in two women, it was a coincidental diagnosis and they actually died from other causes. Again, very pertinent to the, the, the topic we're talking about this evening. Nine of those women who died were from Black, Asian or other minority ethnic groups. But still, I do want to, uh, to emphasise that, that to, to die in the UK from, from COVID-19 in association with pregnancy uh, is still very rare. So it's six women in every 100,000 who were giving birth. But there were some really um, important messages, I think, particularly relevant to, to women from, from black and minority ethnic groups. Um, and advice to stay at home or self-isolate was one of them. Uh, three women died at home or presented to hospital very late, either because they were reluctant to attend hospital for fear of infection, or because they were following uh, advice to stay at home. And it was clear that language barriers were an issue for some women um, and that they were unclear when to go into hospital or indeed when to seek uh, ad advice again, having been told to self-isolate. So it's really important that we still are providing that specific advice um, and making sure that it is understood and that we are involving an appropriate interpreter uh, where necessary. I, the, the topic of, of the evening is, is not just talking about women service users, but it's also talking about their advocates and indeed their families. And I think it was particularly tragic that it, some women didn't see their babies before they died. But in several instances, their partners were unable to see women uh, before they died. And it, it was certainly clear that language difficulties uh, played a part uh, in one instance, in, in one partner really not understanding how, how ill uh, his partner had become. So we do need to emphasise that, that communication with, with partners and families, uh, and again, uh, via interpreter if necessary. It is important at the moment, we do know that uh, there are um, uh, pregnant and postpartum women being admitted to intensive care in the second wave. And uh, sadly, small numbers of women are continuing to die from COVID-19. What um, was very evident was that there were uh, quite a lot of instances where neither the obst obstetric nor the midwifery team were made aware early enough that pregnant women had been admitted with COVID-19. And therefore it wasn't recognized uh, that women were uh, sick because uh, it was assumed that their symptoms were due to their pregnancy. So, for example, a woman uh, with a respiratory rate of 36 that was not recognised to be uh, a, a problem in pregnancy and was assumed to be due to hyperventilation. 
So she wasn't actually seen uh, by a junior obstetrician for 11 hours. And then in fact, the senior was not involved until very late. So it, it's really important that, that women are, are getting that multidisciplinary care. And I guess I just want to finish by, by thinking, about, uh, thinking about biases and, and multiple biases. And for me, this is one of the issues that are facing uh, women from, from uh, black and minority ethnic groups. It, it's a constellation of, of systemic biases and, and sadly pregnant women are still subject to, to systemic biases and as I've just said uh, the majority of the women who died were cared for initially in, in medical settings rather than maternity settings and none of them were treated with antivirals or other medical therapies for COVID-19. And it's really, really important that we ensure that women are receiving treatments. Um, and some of you may well have just been on the uh, teleconference that we've been holding for the recovery trial. We really have to make sure that, that pregnant women and particularly black and minority ethnic uh, women are not excluded from clinical trials. So just to summarize, um, COVID-19 has really, for me, brought the ethnic disparities in pregnancy outcomes into even sharper focus. I do want to continue to emphasize that, that maternal deaths are rare, but other disparities exist, which um, uh, you know, make all of the efforts that you're all taking uh, really important. I, I suspect that some of you will have um, uh, dialed in tonight to, to try and get some of the answers. Um, and for me, everybody asks for a magic bullet. And, and for me, the solutions are not, going, are not straightforward. We're, we're going to hear um, about others' experiences, um, which will certainly uh, emphasize local actions, which have been helpful. But immediate things for me that we need to make sure we're doing now in the context of, of the pandemic is to make sure that all of our women, uh, particularly those from black and minority ethnic groups, particularly those who've got language difficulties, um, have clear advice on when to seek help. Early involvement of that multidisciplinary team, please make sure that you know uh, when there are um, pregnant women in general medical settings. And then we need to think about addressing other biases uh, which affect care for pregnant women so that uh, black and minority ethnic women are not uh, subject to, to multiple biases. I do have to finish by thanking many, many of you who've contributed to, to helping with, with all of these projects and, and generating the important information and obviously also uh, funding for the studies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Marion, for a wonderful presentation and a great talk. And it does highlight some of the challenges in the system. Um, there's a question from um, our participant. You know, the disparities that you've mentioned about, about women born in the UK and those that are born um, in other countries, do we know how long that has been in the statistics? So the, the, the um, uh, figures I showed you for, for infant mortality and for, for neonatal mortality and for preterm birth, that, that analysis was actually only undertaken earlier this year. And that for me was a bit of a revelation, but, but actually emphasizes something that I'm sure many of you have, have, been, have been identifying that we really, we really have to move beyond thinking about broad ethnic groups. We have to think about, uh, about women's individual circumstances and thinking about not only uh, their, their ethnic group, but many other aspects of their background, their medical comorbidities, their social situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and and it, it, it highlights all of that, uh, the, the, the nuance that we need to think about when, when thinking about the women we're caring for. Thank you. And um, another question says, um, do we know the ethnicity for those with the pre-existing comorbidities? 
um, sorry, could you say that again? Do we know the the ethnicity of those with the existing comorbidities in in in, in the group? Uh, when you looked at the uh, women with other pre-existing comorbidities, do we know the ethnicity of that cohort? So, so there's there's no doubt that when we look across whichever ethnic group, that women with pre-existing comorbidities are uh, more at risk of dying. So, for example, if we look amongst uh, Black African, Black Caribbean women women, black African women, black Caribbean women, as well as white women who have pre-existing comorbidities are more likely to, to die. So, so it, it, that is a risk factor across all groups. It doesn't fully explain, however, the disparity, the difference in between the ethnic groups, uh, if we take medical comorbidities into account. Um, and, uh, with the um, with our topic today, um, it, it really touches to the core of, of many people and, and a lot of our participants. And one of the question is, um, you know, um, some are certain that um, how do we move, uh, how do we move to measure and support when we've got such a data? So we've got the data, but how do we move forward? to actually address all the issues i think i think that's really important and it's why i was hopefully um trying to emphasize that although although these these look very stark when we're talking about uh, maternal deaths it is emphasizing that the the numbers of women who die in pregnancy are still very small and it is really you know it's really really important that that women are uh, you know that the that, that, um, discussion around statistics like this doesn't make women avoid care when actually we need to make be making sure that we are providing uh, the the nuanced care for them as individuals that we need um i'm not sure i've got a, an absolute answer as to as to how we should do that but i'd be very happy to to take any suggestions um there's still quite a lot of more questions from our participants and um um people just want to know is is this disparity true as well from other confidential inquiries into the maternal death in other countries is it just in the uk or are other countries as well looking at this disparity that uh, black asian or other ethnic minorities have got a higher chance of mortality due to childbirth so so we know that very similar disparities exist in the us um in the us uh, um, black women have a, uh, about a three to four fold higher uh, maternal mortality rates but i should also add that in the us women the us overall has about a three to four fold higher mortality rate than the uk so so the uk is a much safer place to to give birth um than the US. We don't have, there are not actually confidential inquiries in many countries. So the only other countries in Europe that have such comprehensive confidential inquiries are France and the Netherlands. Uh, they don't um, document similar disparities in the Netherlands, although there is um, a, a suggestion of a, of a disparity in France. Um, but they, I, I haven't seen statistics which show the change over time, which is what, what we've got here. Um, and um, I think um, one last question from the audience. Um, they just wanted clarification just to get this right. Are we saying that babies of, of a mother born in the UK have poor outcomes than those uh, of mothers who were born elsewhere? So if you compare a mother born in the UK so if and the we're, mother born... If we're talking right. about preterm birth rates, yeah. um, it, babies of mothers who were born in the UK are more likely to be born preterm than babies of mothers of the same ethnic group who were born in their country of origin. So, so yes, there is something about uh, that 
that second generation, the environment that we we are providing in the UK, that means that those babies are more likely to be born preterm. And for some ethnic groups, uh, the Pakistani women in particular, that looks to be the same pattern when we're talking about um, uh, neonatal deaths. Okay. Um, I don't know whether there are any questions um, on the chat box, um, but thank you so much. Um, Prof. Marion, thank you for such a wonderful talk and thank you for addressing the questions as well. It's thank been you. a pleasure having you on the platform. Thank you. So I'm just going to hand over to Victoria to introduce our next set of speakers. Hi everyone, evening again. Um, I feel very privileged to introduce the next speaker, uh, a very strong woman who I've got to know uh, much better over previous months. Um, so let me introduce to you Natasha Smith. Uh, Natasha Smith is a service user. She is a doula. She's a breastfeeding supporter and she's a holistic therapist. She runs various workshops on holistic health and well-being on birth preparation, peer support and doula, as well as anti-racism and cultural safety training. Natasha's here this evening um, as a service user and a very strong woman to talk about her personal experience of her journey through maternity services. Over to you, Natasha. Okay. Okay, so my presentation today is called By a Hair's Breadth and it's um, my birth experience and some lessons that I think um, other people would benefit from here in the island, but also that I feel that I've grown to um, reflect on over time as I listen to other women um, and their birth experiences as well. So before I fell pregnant, I was um, fit, healthy, active. I was in my graduate year of teaching. I did the GTP, so I learned on the job. And I fell pregnant towards the end of that training and went into my first year as an NQT um, pregnant. And the pregnancy was pretty normal. Um, the main issue that I had was morning sickness. I had morning sickness the entire way through the pregnancy. Despite um, complaining about it, I didn't really get much support. Um, I was told that it was normal and it was a sign of a healthy pregnancy. Um, but for me, it was quite debilitating. I had a lot of time off work because of it. Um, I felt quite dehydrated for pretty much the whole pregnancy. And it was really uncomfortable. Um, had a lot of bile, a lot of kind of um, burning in, in my throat and my kind of pipe and so um, that was the downside to, to the pregnancy in my experience and um, I wish that I had had more um, care in regards to that. So I went pretty much through the whole pregnancy as normal as with most women in pregnancy. I did experience a little bit of low iron towards the end. I was encouraged to take iron tablets to bring the levels up. Um, and when I had my 37 week check um, or around 37 towards the end of 37, beginning of 38, my blood pressure had, um, there was a higher reading, a raised reading, um, on, on when the doctor took my blood pressure. And so she asked me to uh, go to the hospital till the next day so that I could have an induction. So she didn't provide any information right then, then and there about the induction. I made the assumption that when I would go that I would be given some information about the process and any potential risks 
Um, and again, I kind of look at this story with a bit of hindsight. And um, so, so retelling is quite challenging because there's a lot of things I kind of look back on now and think, gosh, you know, why, was, why did that happen? Um, but at the time I thought it was normal and I was a first time mum. And what you don't know, you don't know. There's no way that you could know, you know, what you don't know. And so um, I went in the next day to have um, a conversation about the induction. Uh, when I went in, the midwife checked my blood pressure. She said to me, she'll um, check me to see if I dilated. And she proceeded to what I thought was check me. It was a lot more painful than what I was expecting. Um, and so I reacted, I said, ouch. And she was like, oh, I gave you a sweep, darling, and kind of petted me, as is to say, there, there. Um, and that was that. I was quite shocked that she had started the process without um, letting me, you know, telling me that she was going to do that. I thought a, a more of a conversation would take place and it didn't. Um, I went home, I told my husband and my mum what happened. They were quite shocked. Um, but I still had this kind of naivety about that. I didn't think that it would lead to anything um, major. I just thought, well, I'll pro probably give birth soon. So um, nothing really happened and they called me in, they said to come in. So I went in, in the next day and, um, you know, the whole day passed. I was kind of waiting around and then in the evening I was told to get comfortable on the ward and they'd give me the pessary. So they gave me the pessary and within a couple of hours I started to experience some cramping. And so I went to the toilet and as I kind of got up and moved, a large plug came out. Um, and so I kind of thought, okay, things are moving now. So I went through the night, um, had more and more cramping and everything was um, at that point normal. I was then moved on to another ward. Um, and one of the things I remember happening a lot was having a lot of blood taken. And again, at that time, I didn't know anything. I just thought this was normal. But what became very frustrating was that we felt that the amounts of blood that they were taking was more than normal. And there was also some um, confusion about where the blood went and that there were some bloods missing. And so they had to retake bloods. And I remember one instance when a, a, a midwife came and she wanted to take blood and she really struggled to get the blood and she just said well I can't do it because your skin's too tough and she went and she tried to find somebody else and I remember that really angering my husband thinking you know actually you're incompetent at taking blood there's nothing thick about Natasha's skin and actually you know um everybody else has managed to do that fine um and then we waited and the pre pregnancy the labor sorry wasn't necessarily kind of like increasing it didn't feel like I was getting any closer however I was in a lot of pain I didn't get offered any pain relief um, at one point I thought let me just go and have a shower and when I went to have a shower I realized that that actually provided me with a lot of pain relief and so for me in my mind was if you need relief have a shower and um, pop into the shower and if possible, when they move you again to your own room, go and get, you know, ask for a, a tub, um, a pool. So they moved me to a room and there wasn't a pool in that room. Um, and when I got to this room, they said to me that I wasn't allowed to move, that I had to stay on the bed because they were going to monitor um, the baby. I really wanted to move around and was constantly told I can't move. Um, I remember crying to the midwife and saying, like, please, I need to like move and just change the way I'm sitting. It's just really uncomfortable. Um, and she just said, no, you need to stay there. And looking back again on that experience, I think to myself, God, you know, that could never happen now. And it just goes to show how vulnerable a first time mum is and, and any woman is in that situation, because part of me wanted to be kind of like the good patient, the good um, service user. I didn't want to fall in disfavour with anybody because these were the people who were supposed to be caring for me. And so I waited and waited in a lot of pain and I ended up vomiting on myself. Bearing in mind all this time had come, I think this was about the second day now, I had very little food to eat um, and I had very little to drink as well. And so I did vomit on myself. Um, and at that point, they said to me that I could go and have a shower. 
And I just remember feeling so upset and so distressed. I called my mum, I said, mum, I need you here. I realised that my husband was getting really, really tired as well. And I just needed somebody to keep an eye on me and just to be aware of anything that was happening. So after that, the um, contractions were intensifying and um, I was then offered other forms of pain relief. And so I pretty much took everything that was going to the point where I was finally offered a, an epidural. And um, when I took the epidural, obviously I wouldn't be able to feel anything. So the following morning, the doctor came in and he said, you need to have a C-section. We're going to be giving you a C-section. At that point, my mum was like, absolutely no. You don't come in and tell her what she's going to do. You need to ask her what she's going to do. She's the person that needs to make that decision. And I said to him that I didn't want a C-section, that I would um, want to give it more time. And so he said that he would allow me until I think it was midday um, to have an opportunity to have the baby in the way that I wanted to, otherwise he'll need to give me a C-section. So we probably waited about an hour and things were progressing. However, at that point, my son's heart rate began to drop. And before I knew it, it was like an episode of um, Holby City. I just remember lots of panic, loads of people kind of running into the room and, um, the doctors telling me to just push, push, and people just screaming at me saying push, push. And so I was just pushing as hard as I could. And um, he said, I'm going to need to give you an episiotomy and we're going to need to use forceps. And so he went ahead and gave me an episiotomy and forceps. And I remember it probably really having a, you know, massive impact on my um parent my, my mom and my husband because I remember my mom can turn around probably thinking there's so much blood everywhere and my husband looked really nervous um and so my son was born and afterwards I just remember feeling extremely tired and they tried to give me the baby to hold and I said you know please take the baby I'm too weak um you know give him to my, my husband or my mom and so they took the baby and I just remember saying, I feel really tired. I'm really, really tired. I feel really cold. And I just remember hearing like alarms going off and being rushed out of the room. And as they were rushing me out of the room, I remember like people tapping me a lot and calling my name and saying, Natasha, stay with us, stay with us. Natasha, can you hear me? And I believe one of the midwives were holding my hand and I just felt like, oh, I feel so tired. And I just remember I keep saying I feel tired. And I remember thinking, I thought to myself, is this what dying feels like? And I can't really remember anything else after that. Um, I must have, you know, passed out or something. And when I woke up, I was in a different room with, um, a sh you know, like the plastic sheeting over me and um, with um, blowing, you know, warm air to keep me warm because I couldn't keep myself warm. I'd lost so much blood. So after that, I remember... Um, they said to me, you need to come and, you know, look after, uh, feed your son because he hasn't had any milk. It's been a, a really long time and um, he needs to feed. And the midwife that had been with me um, prior, uh, she was in the room with me trying to help me to breastfeed, but she was really frantic and she was like, I've really got to go home. And I just remember that she wasn't mean about it. She looked desperate to get home. She was probably very tired. Um, and she was probably also quite traumatized as well from that experience. Um, but I just remember that moment and it has always stuck with me how desperately, how desperate her face looked to, to go home. Um, following that, I was put on the postnatal ward where I had to have, I believe it was two lots of blood for a blood transfusion. And um, the blood transfusion went fine. And I've, afterwards I was moved to another room. When I was moved to this other room, obviously they were concerned about the blood pressure, which was still a little bit raised. Um, and 
I was obviously given medication, but a lot of the time they were kind of missing doses. Um, it was quite, you know, irregular in terms of the checks and the, the doses. And I also, you know, remember seeing my son, as you can see here, he had a lot of bruising on him from the forceps and he's actually still got like a little Harry Potter scar at the top of his forehead now um, from, from the forceps. Um, and the next and the, the next day the midwives came and they said to me we're going to discharge you um and i said i wasn't ready to go home i said I, i'm not ready to to go now i don't feel right this i just don't feel quite right i don't want to go and they said to me you know you really need to go because you know we're um you're more likely to catch an infection if you stay here um, and I felt that they were so eager to make me go, yet I was saying, like, I don't feel well enough to go. So I went home anyway, because I felt like there's nothing I can do. I can't fight to stay. Um, and so I went home and I remember feeling like really unwell that night. I just tried to stick it out. Um, the next day, the midwife came to see me. She, she checked me. I was quite swollen and also... Um, my blood pressure was really really high and so she said to me you need to go back to the hospital right now and she called the hospital to tell them to expect us and so we went back to the hospital during that time it was really quite again quite stressful um we were just kind of hanging around a lot there were no beds there were no rooms for us um and so you know eventually it was just about monitoring us and then finding the right medication there was no diagnosis of pre-eclampsia um and there, there was no protein and things like that um and we didn't really get any conclusions about what was going on i was just expected to eventually just go home once it was under control so for me um there's a few lessons that i learned from my first birth that's my son once we eventually returned home um a lot of this is from from hindsight I realized that there were so many times when information could have been provided to me and it wasn't. I would have been more than glad to have had information about what the induction entailed, um, you know, about pain relief, knowing what I could ask for, um, and general, general informed consent. The amount of time that we actually spent in the hospital there was so such a lack of information. Um, there were so many opportunities that were missed to provide me with information about what could happen next. Um, I don't think that, you know, once you start a process that there's no need to provide a woman with information. I think these are the things that will keep women safe um, and not a fear for her to make her own decisions as well. Um, and I found that when this blood pressure you know it became a fixation and there was a loss of individualized care considering i didn't have a pre um, preclampsia diagnosis the blood pressure didn't spike um this blood pressure just became like this stigma and it really it actually followed me into other pregnancies where again i would experience a restriction of choices despite not having blood pressure throughout the pregnancy but only having it during labor and I'll just move on to my second and third. So this is me with my second and third son, uh, my second son and my third son. Um, and I didn't have the same experience. You know, they say that experience is a great teacher. Um, I didn't have the same experience. And I put that down to being informed, having midwives who were afraid, who, who weren't afraid of you know someone that's outside of the the realm of normal whether it was because of the blood pressure um or, or anything else i relied heavily upon extended support from my social circles i'm very fortunate enough to have a lot of medical professionals as friends um and so their guidance throughout the labor pe period was really helpful for me but not a lot of women have that type of support or social circle and so that was really key to me, particularly in my third pregnancy, where it was a really massive sticking point for healthcare professionals. 
Um, there were other ways to manage the blood pressure to make sure that I was safe and that it wasn't spiking. And so the second and third births, I didn't have, you know, this adverse outcome in my own, um, you know, words. Um, and so one of the other things that I want to kind of leave a message with is that, you know, in terms of my experience with having blood pressure, I think it's so important that there's a differentiation between raised blood pressure and preeclampsia and that we understand that woman's specific circumstances and her health. I think that healthcare professionals um, need to just take into consideration fear. I do get white coat syndrome as well. Um, anxieties if the women are having, you know, have a lot of other things going on. I was in my final year as a um, NQT and it was a stressful working environment and none of those other things were accounted for in my own care. A lack of sleep prior to that, you know, that check that I had that really decided the fate of that first birth experience, but also a lack of sleep throughout that whole, you know, 36 or so hours that I was in hospital or plus um, a lack of dehydration, sorry, dehydration and lack of hydration as well. All of these things will have an effect on someone or prolong, you know, um, these readings as well. And so not only, you know, did I experience that and other women similar to me may experience very similar things, but then we have the added concern and worry of discrimination, unconscious bias or outright racism. And as a service user, you know, six years on from that birth experience, I can see how um, for other women, um, that, that their, their stories are similar to mine. Um, the like, sorry, I'm losing my track. You know, six years on, I've been listening to stories almost identical to my own of women saying that they wasn't listened to or that they didn't know something or wasn't told something. And if I was to give these stories a collective um, summary, it'd almost be like this gospel according to, you know, black maternal experiences, particularly when there's maybe a, a small risk or a, a some sort of risk. Um, and even that word, I think, needs to be really carefully defined. Um, these sad but sacred stories um, carry a single message that for too many women like me, they find that they were a hair's breadth from their final breath. And so I just want us to think about not just the women who have lost their lives, but also the many voices that I say in that they was just also far too close to losing their own lives because they weren't being listened to. They weren't being provided with adequate information and that they weren't supported to make informed decisions. Thank you. I was going to give every minute, everyone just a minute to pause, Natasha, just to really think about what they have heard. Because we all come here tonight as healthcare professionals, charged with giving high quality, safe and personalised care to women. And I think what you've shared with us is so incredibly powerful and highlights where hard-working, really caring clinicians can let women down. And where you were talking, there were words I wrote down, the words that I really struggle with every day, they allow the lack of information. Um, we will let you. Um, one thing I wanted to say to you was, there are so many messages on the chat uh, thanking you for being brave and strong and courageous in coming in and sharing your experience tonight. And there's one here that I wanted to read before I get on to the questions. So one attendee writes, I can only hope that this reflection will cause those of us who are charged with caring for pregnant women to be more compassionate and mindful of women as individuals and meeting their needs appropriately. 
and I, and I think we all need to think about that. Now I have a couple of questions for you. Did you ever sense that you were being given inferior care to others because you were black? So my first son was born in a hospital where the staff looked like me. I think that the care that I had was staff thinking that possibly they didn't need to um, do certain things because, you know, I'll be okay. So it might not be because I was black, but actually because, you know, you're a strong black woman, you'll be fine, you know, um, and there's a possibly a letting down of their own guard. Um, and so then the standard of care will drop because they feel maybe they're relaxed because there's a young black woman here, or they assumed I was young. Um, and, um, you know, so they could do what I want. And we got that a lot. People would comment on how young me and my husband look. So I definitely think also age played a role in that, as well as them feeling quite comfortable. And then if you think, uh, so another question, I suppose I just want to do a bit of comparison because uh, you have three boys and uh, what I've heard is your experience from your first also shaped what was really important to you moving forward with your second and third. So maybe can you share what your relationship was with your caregivers within your first experience and then how that has affected uh, you in your subsequent pregnancies? So what's interesting is in my first pregnancy, I didn't have continuity. So I saw different midwives at different times. Um, and in my, um, in fact, actually, I saw the consultant the first pregnancy because I think it had something to do with my family history. Being that I was uh, from a Caribbean background, I think there was assumptions made that, you know, you're going to have, because it, it came up a lot in all my appointments, diabetes and hypertension. Um, whereas I was lighter and slimmer in my pregnancy than I was when I weren't pregnant. And I've always been lighter and slimmer when I'm pregnant than when I'm not pregnant. Um, so the second pregnancy and the third pregnancy, I had um, continuity. The second midwife, um, she was just kind of quite cold. Like when I was pregnant, she, we didn't have much of a relationship. It was just very much in and out, it was like business. Um, when I was in labor, I thought I was in labor and I told her I think I'm in labor. She said, no, you're not in labor, go home. Um, and then I had my baby the following morning. Um, when I was in the hospital, um, having my second son, there was an obsession over my blood pressure with a particular midwife. Um, and an Asian doctor came in because she had to prescribe um, the medication for me, which is what, um, there was a lot of fuss around the medication. And she said, perhaps she's in, in labor. And she said, let me check her. And so she checked me and I was fully dilated. And at that point, her checking me made me want to push and so my son was born within minutes and he was just born in like a side room where there was like no preparation because they didn't believe I was in labor um but I was quite in control because I was told to go home and I refused to go home the third um pregnancy again slightly different experience um I did go into labor, the blood pressure was a sticking point. They were like, you need to be in this room. I said, I wanted to be in the birth center. They said, we're not gonna let you in the birth center. So I said, I'm gonna go home because I'm just gonna be here for, you know, and I won't be able to sleep. I'd rather go home and sleep. Um, and so they weren't gonna budge. They weren't going to let me into the birth center. Um, and so I thought I'd rather go home. Um, and so I went home and then when the pain got too much, I went back into hospital because I knew it'd be sh a short time before I'd have my baby. And I did. Yeah, it's, 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 women know what is right for them a lot of the time. And, and we as caregivers need to listen. We need to really hear. Um, uh, one of the other questions that's on just now is, do you think your first experience would have been different if you didn't have uh, such a birth companion like your mum uh, when you were being told that you need to have a cesarean section? How do you think your support supported you in your decision making? Yeah, my mum has to be at all my births because she will protect me. And also I think that I'm quite worried that my husband will be seen as aggressive or like a label will be placed on him if he's the person that says, no, you're not gonna do this. No, you're not gonna do that. 
um, when we had our, our first son, the, you know, we wanted my husband to cut the cord and the um, obstetrician, I think, um, he cut the cord um, and he didn't do the delayed camping, obviously, because it was crazy. Um, but yeah, you know, we just, it was just kind of like, why didn't you let him cut the cord? It wouldn't have taken more than, you know, a minute or so to do that. So, you know, we've always been very sensitive to who does the advocating and we have these um, conversations where, you know, me and my mum and my husband will prep each other and say, right, you're going to take on this role and you're going to take on this role because we have to navigate the whole scenario depending on the personalities of the healthcare providers and their own maybe assumptions or power dynamics. It's not just about um, being black, but it's also being a West Indian couple. If people kind of know that there's some some you know groups have perceptions of Caribbean women, very specific ideas about Caribbean women um, and promiscuity or young you know Caribbean couples. And so that plays a role in how we prepare ourselves, if, if I'm being honest, Vicky. We have lots of questions and I'm very glad that hopefully we'll have 15 minutes at the end after uh, Gloria has spoken next. I suppose one that's come up a few times is you have 125 healthcare practitioners on just now, midwives and obstetricians. If you could give them one message to take away with them about giving good personalised care and listening to you coming in the door tomorrow to have your fourth baby, what would it be? Listen, act and support listen to what women are saying is happening in their bodies if they're in pain if they're concerned act on what they're saying if they feel that they need pain relief provide them with pain relief if they're worried about their health and they want further testing or scans or anything like that then provide that for them just you know make sure they're safe double check reassure them and also support them. If they want to give birth in a peaceful, quiet environment, then they support them doing that. We've got really good examples at the Albany model of women just like me who had safe births because they were listened to and they were cared for and they had you know, good carers. Thank you, Natasha. And um, please do stay with us and hopefully we'll be able to uh, talk through uh, the last few questions that we've got when everyone's Thank here. You. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Um, so moving on to our third speaker of the evening, I am also absolutely delighted um, to introduce uh, my colleague, Gloria Rowland. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about Gloria. So she was first trained as a registered nurse and midwife in Nigeria before she relocated to the United Kingdom. She has a strong passion for change, innovation and transformation within health services. Gloria is the first black African director of midwifery in the history of maternity services in the United Kingdom. She leads the Black Asian Minority Ethnic Maternity Leaders COVID-19 response team. She is recently appointed to the Chief Nursing Officer National Advisor Group in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Gloria is now going to take us through the work that she has done. Thank you, Gloria. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming today. And I just want to thank Vicky and colleagues for inviting me. And um, well, some of the things you're going to be hearing from me is a bit, a bit hard to hear. But I think at the end of the day, I think one thing I want us to take away is about we need to get to a point where we get a bit ease at discussing things like this. So we did, um, we started this up during COVID when everything was going on. And um, there were so much, so many things happening around us. And I remember a few of my mom's friends um, being sick and eventually some of them, we lost some. And then I started sort of like having colleagues and friends as well. And you look at the TV and the, the statistics and what was going on was really worrying. And um, 
as um, Marion has rightly said in the beginning, you know, we know a lot about women and so on and so forth, but we don't really talk much about staff. But COVID in itself has actually brought us into a situation whereby we saw a lot of things that were happening because a lot of people will talk about um, having the effect of COVID on black people is because of vitamin D and so on and so forth, so on and all the things that are coming up during that period. However, I didn't want to think about the doctors that died, some of the midwives, some of the nurses that died, they, are, they don't have socioeconomic issue and they actually live a good life. But apparently there are other things that are actually that is affecting them, which at that point we really need to speak up because then it was really getting really, um, really worse in terms of amount of um, black and Asian and ethnic minority group staff that were dying during COVID. And more importantly, people that are actually also very, very sick during this period. So we call the title of our, of our report, Turning the Ted. That wasn't the initial plan. But I think when we have George, um, George Floyd in America, Black Lives Matter, they actually sort of like have to take all that into account because all that was happening during the COVID period. Um, so uh, that is, um, Vicky, I've already told you about me. And I'm just going to take you through what we did. And honestly, maternity, most of the time, you find out that midwives, um, doctors, especially from Black and ethnic minority group, we will probably be more very quiet, especially in maternity, because we are always very busy, labor world and everything. By the time you get old, you are tired. So but it doesn't mean that there's no racism or there is no inequalities or things going on in the maternity services. However, this is the first time we actually had the courage to some more people to actually talk about their experiences. And I will explain something to you. In the beginning, when we thought about this, and I remember speaking to some of the head of Middle Free. I think the first thing I did was, how many head of Middle Free do we have that are from Black and Asian community? And we have about 120 something maternity units in the UK. If we ended up counting ourselves, and we were about nine of us. And we had about seven people that wanted to take part in the, in the, in the whole project. And even to get us starting, a lot of people were worried about their jobs. A lot of people were worried about um, what the chief nurse is going to say. Um, I'm a director of Middle Free. I'm a head of Middle Free. What would they say if i have been seen to be doing this kind of project? And it got to a point we have to say, look, we have to be for people that are coming behind us. Somebody has to start this discussion. Things that are happening around us are just not right, and we need to speak out, really. So those are the beginning of it. We got ourselves together, about um, seven of us in total. Uh, director and head of middle three, and we got some band eights and band sevens again together to join us. And we started it, and we just wanted to hear what people are feeling in maternity in terms of what was going on around us in terms of COVID and the impact on the Black and Asian community. So we then thought about how we can do this. We felt, okay, let's use a sort of like appreciative inquiry methodology. So we, we decided, okay, we're gonna have about four key lines of inquiry we want to look at, and then probably then see what people say. So we decided that we're gonna look at five things. One is to think about the challenges that faces everybody during COVID, especially from the community. And then to understand what support was needed for staff. And, um, so, and also we want to find out about the women and the family family, the communist conception that were going on, so the cultural influences and so on and so forth. We know that during COVID, um, the community, the, the ethnic community is very soft, like very vocal. And sometimes you find that we are very vocal on the WhatsApp group, on, on other platform, in our churches, in our every, everywhere. And there were a lot of self-prescription going on in terms of oppression, putting garlic, putting lemon, putting this, putting that. And vitamin D, a lot of things were going on within the community because everybody was so afraid of what was happening. So we had about 11 forums between 18th of May to 30th of June, and we spoke to about 334 midwives. And we did have observation, but there are not many observations, I must say, on the forum because they, it was particularly 
directed towards midwives, which I think for reflection would have actually sort of like opened it up to everybody because later on, what we later found that actually what we were feeling as midwives, actually the doctors were feeling the same things, um, the same thing as well. People that are from the BEM community. So um, then, then we then found out that actually some people could not attend the forum with this um, survey monkey to get more information from people. And also we, we had the um, George Floyd issue. We want to find out what people are feeling in terms of inequalities and what was going on in the media then. And also at a point we found that actually there were a lot of things about risk assessment and PPE. And so we put on extra sections separately for risk assessment and PPE. So um, I'm going to get, take you through some of the key findings, and I'm not going to read through everything um, in totality. But I've highlighted areas where I, I just felt sometimes we were like worried. Some of the things we had on the forum were things that sometimes I even meet from the back and any minority group. They were shocking things that we, we won't actually believe that they were happening. So some of it are the things that are, we've put up here, some of the challenges people face. I think the biggest one that went through, through that, that, that came through in all the people we spoke about was that fear of being afraid, that anxiousness, that worriness, and that, there's that element of that mental, mental health and mental well-being. And everybody was so worried about what was going on. And, and I think there's another big aspect of it is that lack of trust, the lack of trust, lack of trust from people that um, some of the black and ethnic minority midwives worked with, worked with, and lack of trust from the fact that actually if I tell them about the fact that I'm, I'm actually have an underlying medical condition or something like that, people will stereotype me. So I think it's in both camps really. I think I must say before I carry on that what we wanted to do in this report that was very clear is that we don't want people to come to the forum and mourn and complain. And you see as we go on that we want people to actually be practical in terms of what you're saying at the same time come up with solutions in terms of how we can solve some of the ongoing issue that has been there forever that actually what COVID has only just done was to, to shine um, the light on that. So there's that bit about some of my highlights here. You see, I've just picked some areas here that I've highlighted. I was made to feel that I was being a time waster. I was going off sick for no reason. And she didn't for no reason. And I think there's a lot of things that came out in the forum where people just feel that actually people weren't believing them. And some of the things they relate to us is that, um, and as, like I said, this is just, um, what people said, it, we, there's no empirical evidence behind anything I'm saying. It's just more qualitative data than anything else. And it's just people's view and perception and what they saw and their experiences. Some of the things they told us is that well, they felt that, that some of their non-BAM colleagues were self-isolating and nobody was questioning that. And then when you have a BAM person saying, look, I'm not feeling well, there was a lot of questions and there's a lot of phone calls happen from the manager. And I know this is not, like I said, it is not everybody. It's just probably some of the people we spoke to. So these are some of the things that also people has, um, well, told us um, that happened. Again, one element that I think was a big eye opener, especially for me as the head of Middlefield or director of Middlefield, was the bank and agency staff. And really, it's just what, what we didn't really look, we didn't think about. It's unprecedented. However, this is just some of the things that bank and agency midwives have been going through. Majority of the bank and agency midwives we, we interviewed or we spoke to actually spoke to us and spelled that they were totally out of the loop and they don't really know what was going on. Information was sort of like, um, um, were very sort of like limited in terms of what they got. And obviously they can't access the trust internet. So they are worrying getting the amount of information that everybody else was getting. So key lines of inquiry too, we wanted to know what people consider as one of the, some of the biggest issues. Why are we the ones that are most affected by um, COVID-19? Obviously there's a lot of um, media, there's a lot of um, media coverage. There's a lot of stuff like, um, there's a lot of, information out there in terms of evidence, in terms of what, 
what is causing it, what is not causing it. But mainly, um, majority felt that, and I, I, I heard it when Marion actually spoke about the fact that people didn't want to come to the hospital. And I think those are the, some of the things, there was so many more misinformation, coupled with the fact that some people don't speak English and they don't understand what was going on. And I must say, even among the professionals, we got a lot of misinformation and so on and so forth. So again, I think there's that fear of not coming to the hospital because people are afraid of getting the virus. And actually that message of staying at home doesn't mean staying away when you need that help. I think those are the things that are worrying a lot of people during that period. Um, in terms of the um, key line of uh, inquiry three, we, what we wanted to find out is that how can we actually, what do we actually need to improve for um, women and their families? So again, um, there is a lot of sort of like recommendations. There's a lot of things that came out. And there's, some, there's a lot of things about domestic violence and so on and so forth. And I just want to talk about, uh, take a pause here and talk about the resources. And I know the majority of us went back to her. And back to her was very useful because honestly, at that point, we, we didn't have no much choice in terms of because we don't understand the virus, we don't understand how to really manage it. However, I think what came out is that although the, 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 the virtual clinic and everything worked well, but notwithstanding, it's more or less um, one of the areas that people are worried about is that people that doesn't speak English find it really difficult with the virtual. So it's about thinking about future pandemic, it's about how do we probably think about everybody, not all sides will be solved. Um, Again, there's a big thing about the anatomy. And I, I really want to stop like pause and speak about this. And I will talk about this because um, it's not just in the UK, I must say. Like um, my profile has said, I was trained in Nigeria. And most of the book that they use in training us middle free in school, anatomy and physiology, Margaret Mice, um, um, that time, as mainly not BEM anatomy, it's mainly white anatomy. And honestly, those are the areas of research I think we probably might need to dive into. Because again, there's a lot of assumptions made in terms of how we do things for everybody without actually thinking about some other stuff. And there are other things that people will say and say, well, um, there's a lot of assumption about um, Asian pelvics, Asian perineum, black perineum, black pelvics, and so on and so forth. But again, it's about really, really looking at more research into these areas because those can actually help with why some of these women are dying and some of the things we can do to reduce those, um, those maternal deaths. Um, like I said, there's a lot of emphasis on non-English speaking and how do we really help in terms of that. And the fourth findings was about what, like I said, I don't, we just don't want people to come and say, well, things are not right and pointy fingers. We don't want that. We really want people to come up with, okay, what can we do to make things better? And these are some of the things that people have actually um, given us in terms of some of the things that can make things better. And um, for one of them is that one of the biggest challenges that I'm facing is supporting staff with mental health. And this is from a senior band seven to band eight. Again, not really giving us that equipment to really be able to support staff. And I want to say this is also pertinent to our, well, our not BEM colleagues, especially when you have like from band 80 and above is not BEM. And if a BEM comes to you with a, with a, with a BEM issue, how can it actually not BEM be able to sort of like understand those underlying cultural, cultural issues? And I think this is where we need to start talking about that's sort of like cultural competence, cultural sensitivity. But at the same time, we don't want that segregation. And I'll probably mention that when we come to recommendation. Like I said, there was a lot of things going on about risk assessment. And there was, you know, that was when the risk assessment came out. It was very, very hot. And people, I know in the beginning, there was that thing about them are not even engaging. That's why the fact that there's a lot of media coverage that them people are dying from COVID. But these are the feelings of people. People just feel that it's, it's another thing for exercise. It's vague, it's unclear, it's useless. Some people felt it was a joke. And, and again, and I think as we go, it's about also looking at the fact that I think I made it mandatory my trust when we started talking about risk assessment and there's high emphasis on BEM. I just felt like 
well, it has to be risk assessment for all, not just them. And COVID definitely has affected everybody. Definitely the people that are mostly impacted are BEM community. But however, the thing about it is that in terms of BEM community, it's not just about risk assessing them, what about fit testing, and what about actually making sure that we really listen to them and actually give them, really help them in terms of supporting them with their needs. I think those are the things that are going through people's mind when it comes to risk assessment. And obviously the story about PPE, and I'm, I'm sure everybody knows about that, in terms of PPE, again, it's about fit, fit testing, and there's that thing about anatomy of the face of the BEM community, about the anatomy and physiology of the face of the Asian community. And it all boils down to the fact that actually how do you fit test people so that they get the right marks that will protect them. And then I think another thing that we're still struggling with it today is the fact that even people that have failed fit testing, what are we doing? And again, so it's just mainly thinking about as much as we've learned a lot from the first pandemic, it's about how much progress we've made. We've made a lot of progress, but again, it's about how are we protecting ourselves as healthcare pro professionals. Um, and that's just, again, more about PPE. So in terms of recommendations, because like I said, we really want to sort of like balance this up. And like I said, one of the biggest things that came out of our report is about self-care. Self-care in terms of looking after one another, looking after each other, one about looking after oneself as well. And there's a lot of reflection of some of the things that goes on, the misconception that goes on within the community that we need to deal with ourselves. And there's a lot of things about us really trying to really start trusting people. I just don't, I'm not an advocate, and I think the majority of people that came on that call you are not an advocate of you keeping your underlying medical condition when actually you can seek help on time. So again, it's about practicing what we preach as a community. We tell our staff and we tell our juniors, we tell our clients to actually adhere to certain things and we are not doing it ourselves. So there was a lot of reality check in terms of people that came on the forum and some of the recommendations in this report. And I think on one side of it that I really want to touch on where equality and equality came into this and that's of racism is really really about development um this has this is not just about covid this is just an ongoing issue that's been there for a long time in terms of development but i would say something how I, I was when i was preparing the report and was pulling the report together and i read somewhere actually middle free is one of the one of the profession whereby we have majority of them community that are between band seven and band eight, which in a way is really refreshing to read that. But notwithstanding, I think they are still in the minority. So there's that thing about how do we really support each other? There's always that misconception, not misconception in a way that when people felt, well, I've gone for several interviews and I've not been given the job, what's the point trying? And that goes around so quickly that when the job comes out, people don't apply. So there's that thing about also, what is really stopping people from applying? What, where is it? What, how do we sort of like bridge this mistrust that has been that, that is there within this uh, within the workforce? Those are the things we really need to sort of like really tackle, which we are still thinking of the best way to tackle it. So again, this uh, also is just about also the other things that are happening, which people feel strongly about. When we talk about speak of guidance. I know that majority of the trust will have is sort of like a non bem speak up again. It's gonna be hard. It's really, really hard to have a BEM midwife or then go to speak up like this. It's just not the way people operate. And and some of our recommendation is to actually have a speak up idea that is a BEM, a little a BEM specific issues. People really, really want to achieve this. And there's that thing about lead specialist midwife. And I want to say something. The least specialist midwife doesn't mean least specialist team, um, specialist team. I know that I've spoken to a lot of people about this. They're starting about, we want to segregate women. We want to, it's not about segregating. And actually the, 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 the specialist BEM team doesn't have to be just BEM people. And that would be actually, for us to make that kind of recommendation, it's not practical because we don't have enough. So, it can be people that actually understand them issues that are really interested in them issues. And I think having strong, not them highly as um, 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 friends 
around you and professionals around, around you, I think it goes a long way. There's a lot of things about psychology, uh, psychologists and having the psychologists. And there's that thing about them people not, um, not, um, not exploring or probably not engaging with some of the things that are put out, that are put out there. Unfortunately, the way we were, the genetic makeup, the way we were, we were wired, and I'll say that no matter how educated you are, there's, a, there's so much tradition, there's so much culture being installed in us that sometimes the way we deal with issues is quite different from the way it's being dealt with in, in the community here. Yeah? And it's about really, really understanding some of the issues that actually how to deal with it in a cultural manner. And again, I'm not saying we should create something separate and separate this. Actually, if people are actually well, uh, the ones being imparted, I think you need a little bit more focus in terms of understanding what is really causing the disparity among um, BEM community and the non-BEM community. There's that issue about the fact that even we really want to shift this issue about racism, discrimination, lack of um, equal opportunities, we need to be talking to ourselves like our arms length bodies. And I am talking there about NMC, RCM, and so on and so forth. And if you look at NMC register, we have about 30% of the people that are, are registrants are actually from that community. If you look at the board level, from up, but the board level up, you can't see one single BEM person sitting on that. So how would you actually change the situation when actually you don't have people that understand the issue that sits on the policy making? So one of the recommendations is to actually think about getting more BEM on that seat where policies are being tackled for them to actually be able to voice out some of the issues that are affecting BEM community. And there's a lot of things about voices of BEM um, clients. And really, it's about that thing about maternity voices partnership. Again, if you look at it across the whole England, to have BEM representation in terms of chair is really limited. And I'm not saying there are no BEM chairs, uh, really, but again, it's about getting more people to actually be able to take up some of those posts or probably co-chair so that people can ex understand exactly some of the issues that BEM community faces. And I need to say as well, I know a lot of work has been done in this area, both for staff and for women. And I know there's continued work going on, especially from the chief middle free officer, Matthew Dolly, and so on and so forth nationally, in terms of trying to understand this the national maternity um, voices partnership that are doing a lot of work to actually shift this. So there's a lot of work going on within the community regarding this. And other things is, is, is just more or less to understanding the culture of them and there's that thing about i know there's a lot of things about victim media and so on and so forth i think one of the recommendations from this report is that as much as we want people to take vitamin d what is important is to actually have your vitamin d level check i think that is as important as taking it because again there's a lot of um self um self restriction self medication and so on and so forth without people actually there's no empirical evidence or evidence of how harmful or how helpful these remedies are to the body. And some of the things as well, which people have actually said, mainly this is more or less about maternity. It's about that really looking at that risk stratification, not just medically high risk, it is about looking at social high risk. And how do we combine that? We have risk assessment, risk stratification for staff. How do we then have the same thing for women so that actually the women, the women will get the right here. There's that, um, um, there is that mandate on us that we should give continuity of care, of care to 75% of um, vulnerable women and parent women. However, how do you actually classify who are the people that are, are, most, are, are at, at most need? So again, there's a lot of things about what happened within the antenatal and postnatal world. There's a lot of things that happen in the room where, where, you're, where you're full PPE and actually the steam and actually how do you relieve yourself when you have to actually go on and done off and so on and so forth. These are things within maternity that we really need to think about. I've talked about the, the, the curriculum and really looking at anatomy of um, BEM structure, but I'm not making an assumption that everything a one size fits all in terms of people's anatomy. And the risk assessment, I've already mentioned that. And I think mainly it's about what do we, where do we go from here? The report itself, uh, at the minute we are having a roundtable with the policy maker in terms of how do we move things forward. There is a national steering group looking at the recommendation. We are developing sort of like a quality metrics, um, sort of like a measure in terms of how do we measure things 
not just in terms of COVID, in terms of ongoing development of um, M staff, and mainly also how do we support the understanding of the care we give to BEM women in that BEM community so that we can start shifting those statistics that Mariam presented in the beginning where constantly we have um, the same group of women dying year in, year, um, year in, year out. And I think that's all I've got to sort of like um, say to you today. If you have questions, I'm happy to take um, questions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop sharing. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Thank you so much, Gloria. Wow, you've given us a huge amount of food for thought, both in relation to uh, our, our midwifery colleagues, obstetric colleagues, and also the women that we serve. I suppose sitting here for me as a midwifery leader, um, what's quite startling but not surprising and yes we do need to turn the tide is the number of uh, midwifery leaders that we have from black asian minority ethnic groups so that actually the staff and in my organization around about 50 percent of our staff are from black asian minority ethnic groups see leaders that look like themselves so we've got lots of work to do but there was a sentence in your presentation that really stood out to me that's what staff were asking for were good managers and good leaders. So my question to you, and I'm sure there's a lot of other leaders on here tonight, is what, what would be the three take-home points you'd give to me and every other leader that would help me to be the best, most inclusive uh, leader that has their door open, that makes staff from a black Asian minority ethnic group want to walk through that door and help me learn and grow and develop a service that fits to their needs? I think the first thing I'll say to you is about, um, it's just about fairness. And you can't go wrong with fairness, that's the beginning. It's just about when people see that the process is being fair and some of the things they told us in the forum is that Sometimes the mom them colleague will have had about a job before the job is even advertised. And then the job is advertised, it's closing in two days' time, in three days' time. So again, those are the things we need to think about. And secondly is to say there's so much mistrust. It's about, I think we can build it. And I think it has to be both sides. I'm very, very particular about it. And I was very truthful to people that came on the forum. It has to be both sides. You can't actually say everybody will not trust you or probably you will just have to keep trying. So I think it's about really building that trust. That trust is really important. So, and again, it's about really, if somebody say I'm sick, it's about people just believing that they're sick. I'm not even thinking about it other way around. So why will someone, one, if one BEM say I'm, I'm sick and it's okay, and the BEM staff say I'm sick, then you're doubting. So I, again, it's, it's just on both, on that level. Then the third thing is about, um, Talent spotting. And now I can give an advice in terms of some of the things I'm doing at the minute. So if I have people that comes that comes for let's say interview, or probably people that actually have shortlisted doing sort of like interview process and I didn't meet the shortlisting criteria, I do go back to them. But for me, whether black, yellow, or green color, I don't see color. And people that knows me would probably say that I will ask you the question. I will speak to the candidates and say you are not shortlisted. So far, I don't have. Obviously, if I have one of one sixty people are shortlisted, that would be too much to actually go to. So let's say I have about three, four people that are not shortlisted. The Akanu Akuni shortlist. I will ask them. I will let them know why they were not shortlisted because it's good for their learning. And two, I do give people opportunity to say, do you want to sit on the panel of the interview? Mm -hmm. Definitely, we'll ask the other candidate and make sure they are comfortable with that. And then it's just sometimes when people know where the gaps are, then that gives them something to work on. Mm -hmm. And then what we do as well is we then develop a sort of like a career, put a career pathway or mentorship around them to help them grow, especially if they're from them community. And I think it's, again, it's about that confidence building and so on and so forth. And I know a lot of us are doing a lot of different things to support that agenda. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. I think, you know, looking at shortlisting criteria, looking at how we feed back to staff, looking at how we change our processes around 
interviews that, that makes it as open to everybody as possible. Thank you for that. Um, so before I ask the next question, a lot of people have put in the chat, thank you for starting and driving forward this work. So I want to share that with you from the group that we have on here tonight. One of the next questions that's come up quite a bit is around the use of the term BAME. And, and, and I, I check myself a lot and I always use the, the Black Asian minority ethnic groups. I make sure that I, I don't put it into a small term. But you use it a lot in your presentation. Um, and the person who's asked this and sort of if I, if I group together the questions, they're aware of the term becoming disliked. Um, how can we ensure that we acknowledge the discrimination without potentially causing offence? And, you know, is using the term BAME saying not white in inverted commas? So I, I just, I think there's a, a lot of question around how do we, you know, we use abbreviations a lot. How do we get this right? And is it right for uh, one member of staff from a specific ethnic background to be able to use it, but others not. I think if you could elaborate on that a bit, I think that would help people on tonight. I think, you see, it, it's a difficult one, I would say, because I, I know there's a lot of these out there. There's even a lot of articles there from people that will say, don't call me BEM, I'm not a BEM, I'm not BME, I'm not, I'm not this, I'm not that. I think it doesn't change the fundamental reason of, um, of the issues we are dealing with. Um, personally, whether we use the black, we call it in full, black ethnic minority, a black Asian ethnic minority, black ethnic minority, or minority ethnic group, whatever it is that we call it, actually doesn't re remove the, the discrimination, doesn't remove the racism, doesn't remove the lack of equal opportunities. And honestly, honestly, I won't be able to really, well, I know some people take offense, whether we call them BAM or they call them BME take offense in that but as far as i'm concerned it hasn't it doesn't change what is really going on and i think if we keep our focus on what actually dealing with what is going on rather than actually focusing on calling on what a name or abbreviation is i think that will work more i think we should probably do away with that that issue about abbreviation calling me them and the stereotype aspect of it and actually deal with the underlying issues thank you and then my last question to you um, that has come up is, is if we move over onto the women a little bit, is around maternity voices partnerships. So the questions come up around them being designed by white middle class women and the majority of their chairs being white women too. And, and the recognition that we need to ensure that black and brown women feel heard and are in a safe environment. Um, do you have any recommendations to everyone that's on tonight about how we may be able to move forward to ensure that our maternity voices partnerships are more reflective of the women that we serve? I know in all fairness, Sarah, I don't know whether Sarah is on the, on the call. Sarah is the, um, is the, I think is the National Maternity Voices Partnership. Um, chair. I know she's doing a lot of work to actually pull this back and get more representation but what I would say is that, especially for people that are from outside London, where you don't have enough um, black and ethnic minority um, people attending your um, maternity voices partnership, is to try and actually have a sort of like, even if it's just once or twice a year, where you have a sort of like a, an event or a sort of like engagement event with this community to actually just hear what, they, they, what, what they've got to see. Even look at some of the statistics of UCOS in terms of people that were sick, uh, that were actually not living in London, we found that it's still within the black and ethnic minority, uh, black and Asian ethnic minority group. Again, it's about really, really giving them the opportunity at least once or twice a year to hear their voices as well. Also, the way we engage is quite, uh, I know people put surveys out. Some people will even at the same time even interpret, um, interpret the survey into other languages. And I did my dissertation on language, really. And I'm from Nigeria and I speak my language fluently. But given my language to read, I can't. So I think people just assume that when you translate to it and then people will engage with that and then they will engage with the survey. It's not going to happen that way. 
the way to engage with this community is by speaking. In, in the community, if you go back home, the way we engage and mobilize people to take immunization back home as a nurse at time is by campaign. His voice is by words of mouth. And that's how the community works. So sending documents, writing documents, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's all right, it's important. But if you really want to hear their people's voices, you have to speak to them. That's the way to engage. Um, and where I suppose where we can engage, then there are you know, voices within the communities that engage with the communities that know the experiences that can share it with us. You know, there are many ways. I think sometimes it's about us thinking outside the box and doing things a bit differently. And we definitely have to do lots of things differently to what we have been doing historically to reduce the disparities that we see happening just now. So I want to say a big thank you from me and from everybody who's on here. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Chim and, and bring Natasha back um, because I know Chim has been keeping an eye on all the questions and may will be able to share them between you both and, and may offer the opportunity for some of those who are on here tonight with us in the last 10 minutes to potentially ask their question to you themselves. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um... Thank you so much, uh, Vicky, and thank you, Gloria, for such a wonderful presentation. And thank you, Natasha, as well, for sharing with us your personal story. It's really touching, and you've really highlighted some of the important issues in the services. Um, we just wanted to open the floor to people. If anyone else has got a question to Natasha for the last five minutes, um, um, if you could just probably raise your hand, Louise will be able to just unmute you so you can ask your questions or you can say your comments. Uh, I'm just going to give it maybe a minute or uh, two minutes or so. We've got a hand from SCL. I uh, don't know whether Louise, you can see that. and. Uh, let's see if we can unmute you. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. So I was a little bit traumatized myself to hear Natasha repeat her birth story. And I just wondered about whether she herself was traumatized by having to repeat the story. This is something I see happening in the MVPs across the country and it worries me a little bit. I'm a practicing midwife. It worries me a little bit that we are inviting women to retell stories that have traumatized them in the past. So I just really wanted to understand from Natasha whether that in fact has happened to her and if there is anything that would help her, if it has happened, would help to ameliorate some of that repeat trauma. Thank you, Elsie. Um, so repeating the story wasn't traumatic. It was emotional because for me, this is the first time fully, well, not fully, but going into probably more detail than usual um, to share my story. So for that reason, it was emotional sharing it. Um, I think the trauma sits with the event itself and, um, you know, having to kind of, the more knowledge I have now uh, in terms of as a service user rep and as a doula, the more I see the failings in my care. And that can be, again, like quite upsetting. Um, and also learning about, you know, other processes such as open disclosure and different types of mediation that was a that should have been available to me and other women like me again that's upsetting knowing that many of us are not offered that and probably many of us are living you know lives with ptsd and actually not it's not being picked up on or you know anxiety which you know stems from our birth experience um, and so um, that's something that you know upsets me and obviously concerns me as a service user representative for other women. I definitely think going forward, something that would be um, helpful for me and possibly other women is just to ensure that the care providers learn lessons and just start to listen to women like me who are saying, 
um, you know, we weren't listened to um, and, and actually start to listen to us and care for us, um, include, you know, and, and make sure there's the compassion in the care as well. Thank you so much, um, Natasha, for that. Uh, we'll take one more question from the audience. Um, I cannot see whether no one else has raised their hand, but uh, if not, there is one question um, that someone has just commented um, from the uh, from our first speaker, uh, Prof. Marion, um, uh, and it's just a comment to say that. Um, there have been systemic biases uh, detrimental to women of black, Asian and ethnic minority backgrounds. This is confounded by conscious and unconscious biases held by staff caring for such individuals. How can we better this situation? Training for staff re biases that may be in that may impact the care of such women if so this needs to be highlighted and acted upon agentry and i think um i know marion is not on the platform but uh um i know that they've been uh louise would comment on this as well there are programs and there are online training programs uh concerning training staff about inequalities training staff uh, um, ab about this and race and inequalities. Um, so this is something else I think raising awareness as a team, uh, all of us to know about this and the more we raise awareness, the more we understand about this, the more uh, things can improve within our services. Uh, I'm just gonna ask Gloria whether Gloria wants to have a comment at this as well, because we've been dealing with a lot of uh, uh, such such issues. Uh, I think in terms of biases, uh, well, uh, there is conscious and unconscious. I will say, and I, I would say um, sometimes it's it's really really hard. And I, I use one analogy, and I'll probably say it here. Even myself getting to where I am. I mean, if you look at the profile being the first director of Middle Free African. I'm not, I just want to make that clear. I'm not the first black director of Middle Free. I've used African, because African is really important to put African here. Um, and the thing is that we've had a lot of African that have been in this country for a long time, in the early 90s and so on and so forth, that are midwives as well. And you find that sometimes, um, I say to people, especially by the time you get up there, sometimes it's really hard. Because again, if you are going to a sort of like a meeting, you don't really, you, you have to read the papers of the meeting. At the same time, as a black person going to that meeting, you still have to deal with, okay, how would I comport myself so that they don't read meanings to it? And um, how do I speak? So, you know, like, there are so many things that you go through apart from all that. So there's that thing about white privileges and, the, and why people, why, when people don't understand it that actually there are so many things you have to deal with. So there's a lot of things about biases, which whether conscious or unconscious, or unconscious bias. And I feel that actually there are more conscious bias than unconscious. That, that, that's, that's, my, my, that's my take on it. So I, again, it's about, and there's that stereotype thing about it. There are times that you come to a meeting, maybe a little bit, a bit late, and actually it's not every time. Then you have a peep, somebody that, Perpetually, they are always coming late. But you find that you enter the meeting, everybody looks at, at the clock. And then this particular person comes to the meeting and it's fine, everybody's smiling. And you're just like, how can this be right? So again, um, like I said, there are a lot of things that we need to work on as black people and also um, from that community. A lot of things that we need to change ourselves. So I, I'm not a believer of putting the blame on the culture alone. I think it's both ways. And that's the only way we can shift things. It's, we can't put it on just the society and the system. We have to do all, have all that is that we need to work on ourselves. Okay, thank you so much. We'll take the last question from one of our members, Natasha. I think, sorry, it's Michelle. 
um, on the audience, if we can just unmute Michelle. Um, she had her hand up. Hi, Natasha, it's Michelle, your, your sidekick. Um, being that you've been quite new to the service user voice representative, experience and team it's been an absolute pleasure to work alongside you but how do you feel we can encourage more women like yourself to be service user representatives and what do you think is needed to support you in that role I think we need to firstly think about the women who um, you know the backgrounds from what, where they're going to come from so one of the things that people have acknowledged throughout covid for example is that many people who had poor um you know outcomes were from socio um, economic situations where they were maybe on the lower end um and, and there was different types of kind of like geographical and housing issues um so you know transport was an issue um overcrowding the cost of traveling all of those things so when i think about the service user a lot of those um, ideas transfer over so if for example we have um, a service user event it's in a set location then you're only going to get the same people coming to that engagement event if you're not moving it around your county or your area then you're not going to get a diversity just of your own local area let alone from groups um, that are maybe a minority in a particular area i know not all areas um black and asian people are the minority there's some areas where there's more of um, of those people in a particular area so it's really getting to know those communities and making sure it's actually accessible particularly if we're thinking about the economics of things is it costing them a lot of money to get there you know getting a train or a bus in london is really expensive but in other parts of the country like the west midlands the east midlands the north you know traveling is a long um arduous task there may be only one route to somewhere there may be no bus stops to that place so certainly just really you know getting down to thinking about how you know people um need to engage um and again just also think about is that a safe space will people feel comfortable um with you leading that meeting or is it you know heavy with healthcare professionals go to mvp meetings and sometimes you know it's you and one other service user with consultants and all these other people in suits and actually it's quite intimidating so thinking about the actual environment i went once to a meeting and never went back again um, and that, and i'm somebody who's quite confident so you know just thinking a bit more about the actual experience of um, engagement so yeah that's what i can think of right now michelle uh Thank you so much, um, Natasha, and thank you so much, Gloria, for your really um, um, uh, good presentation, your personal stories that have touched many people on the platform today. I'm just gonna hand over to our president, uh, Louise, uh, for the final remark. Thank you, Louise, over to you. Thank you. I was trying to screen share and talk and turn my video on and it's all um, too complicated, I'm afraid. Um, so um, thank you, um, Vicky and Chim, um, for giving me the privilege of closing um, this uh, webinar. Thank you to all of our speakers. I think everyone um, can agree. Um, it's been a, a, an amazing evening with, with honesty, openness. It's been real. It's been moving. It's been humbling. Um, I think that 2020 is fair to say is going to go down in history as a year to be remembered. Um, but I genuinely hope it's not just for COVID, um, but that 2020 will go down as the year when the inequity that exists for women and staff of black, Asian and minority ethnic heritage is, has truly been heard and understood by the maternity community. And I think events like this evening hopefully is part of how um, we can all um, uh, just really um, appreciate um, the situation that we're that we're in as a maternity community. I, I do believe that once you've heard what we've heard tonight, and when you've um, reflected on it and and begun to glimpse at the understanding of, of of what people have shared, that we all absolutely have a responsibility to address it. 
I'm sure many um, are aware of the uh, race equality task force at the RCOG that has been launched this year. And I'd just like to share a few words from uh, Christina Ketchy, who's um, the RCOG spokesperson for racial equality, who said um, the launch of the race equality task force at the RCOG sends a clear and brave message to our members and the women that we serve of our strong commitment to equality and outcomes for all obstetricians and gynaecologists in the UK and for the health and e of each and every woman. And I feel absolutely certain that we can, of course, add to that to all midwives, neonatologists, anaesthetists, um, and all healthcare professionals um, uh, working within maternity services. And now I can say on behalf of all BICS members, and I know many of you are on the, on the webinar this evening, that the British Interpartum Care Society is committed to equity committed to understanding more about the whys behind the inequity that we've heard about this evening and committed to change. So I'd like to thank you all for coming and participating. I look forward to seeing you hopefully all next Monday for the last of the, uh, this series of, uh, of, of virtual BIX20 webinars. And to, um, to steal some of Natasha's words, um, listen, act, support. We can all do that. And to follow up with how we closed the BICS uh, uh, conference last year. And I think this is really important for all of us. Be kind and be the change. So thank you all very much for coming, for your um, attendance and for hopefully we've given you the opportunity to have something to, um, to reflect on. And uh, I look forward to seeing many of you in, in real life in the future and many of you next week for our final webinar. Thank you all very much. <laughs>